Amen. Amen. Isn't it good to be back in the house of the Lord? What was that? Oh, y'all better quit playing church. Thanks to my brother, Minister Wright, for really encouraging us this morning. I was telling him I was out at John MacArthur's church last, last Sunday, and the way they approached service, it wasn't playtime. There was a seriousness about what was about to happen. And so we were just talking about how we set the tone for that. And so that's, what he, that's where he was coming from, a place he was really, truly, truly, truly want to set the tone for what we're about to partake in. We are going to enter into the presence of a holy, holy God. And we can't just approach him any old kind of way. We come in here with these attitudes and all the stuff from the world. Check that when you hit them doors right there. We are in the sanctuary. And we need to hear from our God. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you are a mother, a mother, please stand. If you are a mother, please stand. If you are motherly, please stand. Mothers, we salute you. Amen. Nothing like mama. Nothing like mama. I don't care what you go through. There's nothing like mama. Amen? Amen. Well, I have the privilege of having grandma, my mother, and my sister in the house this, today. Amen. Three generations. And if, they, if my sister was to move where my wife is, they all three of them look just alike. They look just alike. Praise God to my wife. Appreciate uh, all that she does. Appreciate you. Uh, so let's get into the word. Difficult text today. Difficult text today. And if you have your Bibles, if you will turn to Titus. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And if you will please stand as we honor God in the reading of his word. Titus chapter 2, and I'm going to start in verse 1, but our spotlight today is going to be on verses 3 through 5, but we're going to start with verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious, malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Amen. Let's pray. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, you are our strength. You are our redeemer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And so I would just want to talk for a few moments, maturing in the faith maturing in the faith, instructions for godly women. Now, our focus is on the women, but brothers, don't turn me off because I got some stuff for you too. But our focus is going to be for the women because it is Mother's Day. So what better day to encourage our women? Amen? Y'all, boy, y'all slow this morning. Y'all better wake it up. <laughs> So one of the things you hear 
When you go to other churches and you, you hear them talk, they talk about Titus 2. We want to be a Titus 2 ministry. Titus 2. Well, what is Titus 2 all about? And a lot of times we will say, we want to have a Titus 2 ministry, you know, where the women, the older women are teaching the younger women. But that's where we cut it off. That's where we cut it That You never hear them say the rest of the verses. You just say, we, we, you know, we need some older women in the church to teach the younger women. Well, what are we going to teach them? What does Titus 2 really say? That's why I said we have a difficult text this morning. But walk with me. Walk with me. It, it, it's going to be good when we, when we finish it, okay? All right, so we have Titus. Titus. Now, this is that little book. Uh, it's, it's, it's part of the pastoral epistles when you have 1 Timothy 2 Timothy and Titus. Titus, you don't hear a lot of sermons coming from Titus, but when you want to set things in order at the church, that's the book you want to go to. When you want to get everybody straight and in their right positions, that's the book you want to go to. And so check this out. This is what the key word to the book of Titus is, the conduct manual. The conduct manual. So that already tells you what we're going to be talking about right then. We're going to be talking about how we should behave in the house of God. How should we behave as older men, as older women, as younger women in the household of God? And so the key verses is chapter 1 and verse 5. The reason I left you in Crete, Paul's talking to Titus. He said, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Now, here's the other key verse. Chapter 3, verse 8. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. In this letter, Paul shares with Titus some practical wisdom regarding church organization and administration. Church members of all ages must be encouraged to live lives worthy of the gospel they claim to believe. See, it's easy for us to come in here and play church on Sunday. But the moment we walk out of these doors, how are we conducting ourselves? Are we really representing the God that we come in here and sing holy, holy about. On Sunday, it's really easy. We come in here, we look good, we can say amen. We got that one saying, I'm going to pray for you. Oh, sister, I'm going to pray for you. Brother, I'm going to pray for you. Are we really praying? When we walk out of the sanctuary, do we really pray? Are the concerns of others really on our minds when we walk out of here? It sounds good in here. And so Paul's telling, he's challenging Titus, get things in order. For you to have a sound church, things got to be straightened out. We got to get leaders where they need to be. We need the men doing what they're supposed to be doing, and we need the women to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. This is how we can have a sound church. This is how we have a sound church. So brothers, if I get up on Father's Day, we're coming right back to this passage. Okay, but I, I, I got to let y'all go for the day. We got to talk about the women. All right. Mother's Day came first on the calendar. <laughs> okay, so he says in, in, in the way he starts out chapter two, he said, but as for you, Paul's talking to Titus, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. This is where it all starts at. The doctrine has to be sound. It can't be made up doctrine. It can't be doctrine that we bend to fit our own wants and needs. It has to be exactly what the text says it is. So this is, this is Paul challenging Titus. This is how you set the church up. This is how you get things in order. Practice sound doctrine. Okay? Who does he hit first? The men. Look at verse 2. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, and love and perseverance. Why does he touch the men first? Because the men are supposed to be the example for the women. See, I, I, I can't come to you right today 
But wait till Father's Day. We come right back to this text, okay? The men are supposed to be the example for the women. And the leaders are supposed to be the example for everybody. See, there's order. There's order. I know you don't like it sometimes, but there's order. There's order in the Godhead. You don't see the son do anything outside of the father's will. There's order in the Godhead. So if there's order in the Godhead, there has to be order in the church. There has to be order at home. And so we move past the men and we get to the women. The tightest two women we all love to talk about. The tightest two women. And so, again, our title, Maturing in the Faith. What are some indicators to show that I'm maturing in the faith? And so Titus gives us some instructions, instructions for godly women. Because, see, you've got to be in the household of faith for this to work. That's right. You can't be outside of the household of faith because it's not going to work for you. Right. You've got to be in the household of faith. That's why I said instructions for godly women. We'll deal with the, those that are, not, or that are outside of the faith at near the end of service. But for right now, instructions for godly women, maturing in the faith. What are those indicators to let me know that I am maturing as a woman of God? What are those indicators? The first thing I see in verse number three is to exhibit spiritual maturity, the conduct of older women. Now, the first, the one thing that we say here is we don't say older women. We say seasoned saints. Now, just because we call you seasoned doesn't mean that you season the way you conduct yourself. Hold me, Holy Ghost. See, there, there's more to that word season, not just in age, but also in maturity. And so we want to get them both right, Okay. So the first thing Paul says, I mean, I'm sorry, the first thing, yeah, the first thing Paul says to Titus, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior. Stop right there. What is he talking about? Reverent in their behavior. To behave like holy priestesses serving in God's temple. Paul first draws a word from the Roman world to capture the entire bearing of these godly role model women in Christ's church. The Greek word translated reverent is used only here in the Bible. It's the only place he uses this. And it conveys the idea of priest-like. So in their reverence, they should be priest-like. Okay? Paul uses this to describe a devout woman that has godly character, and the older women are to, to live like holy priestesses, Serving in the presence of God. Their sacred personal devotion to the Lord has slowly come to influence every aspect of their lives. They should be reverent. Reverent in their behavior. The way they act should correspond with the way they believe. With the way they believe, there should be a correspondence there. And that should happen on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Not just on Sunday. So that's the first thing he says. They should be priestesses. They should act like priestesses. There's a way that they should conduct themselves reverent in their behavior. This is the older woman. Now, one of the things I forgot to tell you is when he's talking about older women and younger women, we're talking about from the older women, we're looking at about age 60 and up. And for the younger women, we're looking about from 20 to 60. Okay? So, let's look at uh, 1 Timothy. Do you want to turn? I'm just going to read it for you. 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10. I also want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. What is he saying there? He ain't saying you can't get your hair braided. He ain't saying you can't wear gold. 
what he's saying is don't be concerned so much with the outer appearance. He's more concerned about the inner person. He's concerned about the inner inside of you because that's going to speak more volumes than all the hair that you can put together, all the gold earrings you can put together, all the jewelry you can put around your neck. When you take all of that off, who are you? Who are you when you take all of that off? Are you reverent in your behavior? Behavior speaks much more volumes, volumes, than these acts that we like to put on from time to time. Reverent in our behavior. They have presented themselves to the Lord. They have begun to live life the way God asked them to live. Watch this. This is good. As a walking temple of God. As a walking temple of God. So let's, 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 let's pause right here. If you're a walking temple, when you come to church on Sunday, you don't cuss inside the church. Woo! But when we get outside, what's coming out of you? What, what's, what's coming out of you? If you're presenting yourself as a walking temple of God. See, I understand it in the beginning when you first get saved, but as the sanctification process continues, right. as you continue to commit yourself to the Lord, right. that old stuff should fall off of you. That's right. That's right. Oh, yeah. Now, you may have a moment or two where you slip up, but it just shouldn't be the norm to just coming off your mouth like that. You breaking people off something deep, boy. You have what I call the potty mouth. Watch this. As a consecrated priest of God. Here you go, Marcellus, from Bible study on Thursday. As a living sacrifice. That means I'm denying self. I'm not gratifying the desires of my heart as a living sacrifice and as a bond servant of the Lord. When we say a bond servant, what we're saying is you're totally sold out to the cause. Everybody laughs at me because I drive around with my car and on the back of my license plate it says Pittsburgh Steelers. But what does that mean? I'm totally sold out to my team totally sold out. So what am I trying to tell you? We need to be totally sold out in the way we conduct ourselves, women. We need to be that godly priest so that when people look at you, there's something different about you. It's just something about you that's different. Not that, boy, I can't, uh oh, here she comes. Let me get on over here. That's not the way you want to conduct yourselves. You want to conduct yourselves, women, in a way that is reverent to God. So then he says, still in verse 3, not malicious gossips. Uh-oh. Let's stay right here. Not malicious gossips. Now, the Greek word is diabolos, which means devil, slander, false accusers, verbal assault. Godly, mature women never are to surrender their tongues to the devil. They are prompted by the Holy Spirit to make sure that they say, say that they they say is absolutely true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report before they say it lest they discredit their ministry's effectiveness as a Titus II woman. See, when you walk around doing all that talking, you discredit the effectiveness that you could have because people don't want to talk to you. And the last thing they want to do is talk to you about God. So guess what now? 
Titus talks about later in, in the book, he says, now the gospel is not attractive. Man. Now the gospel is not attractive. Look what Jesus says in John 8 and 44. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire, desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. Jesus said that. Malicious talk, rationalized gossip, and innocent gossip. Watch this. This usually starts with proper motives and desires, but gets off course with unwise sharing of sensitive information. Then curiosity sets in, and soon the conversation is far beyond the problem and the solution and has become malicious, slanderous, and harmful gossip. And so Titus is saying, oh, the women, you can't be this. You can't be this. Reverend in our behavior, not malicious gossips. Now, I'm going to give you two things to help you out. You can write this down. Two things that will help you out when it comes to gossip. Think first. That's number one. Before starting to say something, pause a few seconds and ask, are these words true or false, exaggerated or accurate, healing or cutting, grateful, or are they just, you're just complaining? Think first, talk less. Talk less. It is a biblical fact that the less you talk, the wiser you appear. Plan, prepare, concentrate, enrich each opportunity to speak. Make each, each a time to speak. As 1 Peter 4.11 says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. And so he says, we can't be malicious gossips. And that hits all of us, y'all. That ain't just women. That's men, too, because we can do the same thing. We can do the same thing. So I ain't just getting on you women. It's, it's all of us, okay? Because remember, he started out with men. So I, I ain't just piling on you this, this morning, okay? So then the, look at the next thing. We still in verse 3, or verse 2, I'm sorry. No, verse 3. Not nor enslave too much wine. Now, I know what you're saying. Well, is it okay to have a drink? The Bible don't say. Oh, watch this now. There is nothing wrong with having a drink. The problem is how much. And only you know your limits. Because, see, one glass for you and one glass for somebody else might be two totally different things. Because here's what the problem is. The wine, once it becomes, once you consume it and it's more than what your body can handle, now you're being controlled by something else. You're being controlled by something else. And so words might start to come out that you didn't want to come out. Things might start to get said that you didn't want to be said. We were on a cruise a few years back, and we were sitting down with some family members, and one of the family members had a little bit too much to drink. And we found out there was another family member we didn't know anything about. <laughs> I said, did you just say that? And they act like it was just normal conversation. But they were being controlled by what they were consuming. And we were sitting there, and I said, I looked at Camille and said, did you, did you hear that? And she said, yeah, I, I think I heard it. You brought somebody to the equation that we never heard of because you were being controlled by an outside source. Women, be controlled by the inside source. Be controlled by the Spirit. Y'all know the famous verse we like to, to claim, Ephesians 5 and 18. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled. 
filled with the Spirit. Because when you're filled with the Spirit, it's going to keep you from saying things you don't have no business saying. It's going to keep you out of a lot of trouble. That's a, one of the things that I, I'm really trying to work on myself is when you hear something, and it, it may not be pleasing, it may throw you off course, you may not even like it, but just, like I said, pause for a moment. Pause for a moment before you react. Because you might say or do something that you didn't intend. And once it's out there, you can't reel it back. Okay. So moving right along. So he says, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious, malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine. Then he flips it. He says, teaching what is good. And it refers to that which is noble, excellent, holy, and godly. Mature women have spirit, are to have spiritual integrity. They train others in the pattern they have learned. Watch this. Please get this one. Their walk speaks louder than their talk. Their walk speaks louder than their talk. These are the indicators to let you know, am I maturing in the faith? Because if we still on the baby food and we 65, 70 years old, now I understand it if you just came into the faith. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. But if you've been walking with the Lord for all this time, it should be some difference in you. And guess what? It may not be attractive to the world, but it's attractive to our Lord and Savior. And guess what? His audience is the only one that matters. His audience is the only one that matters. Now, I'm not trying to tell you, don't fix yourself up, just walk around here looking at any old kind. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is God is more concerned about who you are inside. Who you are inside. How you present yourself first to him, second to his people. Amen? There's a, there's a seasoned saint in our congregation. I'm not going to mention her name. And she came to our church a few years back. And she was, I had her in new members class. And for whatever reason, we just hit it off. You know, we just hit it off. And when she came in, you know, she had came in and a lot of different things were going on in her, in her home. And she was telling me about some things with her husband and just things were kind of out of order. And so I gave her some, some information. I told her, you know, what you need to do, da, 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 da. So as the years has gone on, she comes up to me periodically and she'll say, guess what happened at home? And we'll laugh about it. And I mean, she, she says some very unique things. And so, and she's, she's publicly said them in Sunday school class and in other, other arenas. And she always says, you know, Pastor Lewis, you stayed on me and, you know, you really got me going and you, 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 you told me to do this. And she said, and she keeps coming to me, guess what happened at home? But you know what it really is? It's not me. It's because she's applying what the Bible says. And it's changing her home. It's affecting her home. Guess what she's showing? She's showing spiritual maturity. She's showing spiritual maturity. You want your home life to change? You want your marriage to change? You want your job situation to change? Apply the principles of Scripture exactly as they are given. When you go to the doctor, the doctor don't say, well, take these whenever you feel like it. He don't, he don't say that. He says... Matter of fact, he says, even when you start to feel better, take them until they're completely gone. That's, right. That's, right. that's the same way we have to do with God. Women, that's the same way. If you want to be a mature woman, that Titus 2 woman, you've got to follow the examples that God gives us in Scripture. Okay. So we have 
exhibit spiritual maturity, and we have the conduct of the older women. Now we shift and we go to the encouragement of spiritual, uh, and to be encouraged spiritual disciplines, okay? So now the older women are to encourage spiritual disciplines. So they are supposed to turn around and encourage spiritual discipline to the younger women. Now, if you ain't got the first part of this right, don't worry about it, okay? You, you, you ain't ready to do that yet. Because guess what? You're going to cause problems. You're going to cause some serious problems. But when you got this together, then you turn around and you share this with the younger women. And here are the disciplines, the counsel to the younger women. Look at the first thing he brings up. Devotion to the family. Mature older, older women have the responsibility of teaching the younger women how to be successful wives, mothers, and housekeepers. And the younger women have the responsibility of listening and obeying. So younger women, it's, only, it's your responsibility to listen to what is being presented before you, the example. Okay? So verse 4 Verse, verse 3 is the springboard for verse 4 because he said, look at the end of verse 3, teaching what is good. He told the women, teaching what is good. What are they going to teach? They're going to teach some spiritual disciplines. And the first thing they teach is devotion to the family. And the first thing they say is love their husbands. Conveys the idea of tender affection and commitment. This is getting ready to be tough, but we're going to get through it, okay? It means to be a woman totally devoted to one's husband. Some women say their husbands are no longer lovable, but having that attitude is disobedience to the clear word of God. To help your attitude, keep in mind that loving your husband doesn't mean you'll always feel the rush of emotion. That characterizes your love at the beginning of your relationship. Y'all know how it is when we get when, when it first breaks off. We all Google eyed at each other. You hang up. No, you hang up. You hang up. No, you hang up. Yeah. Yep. 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 You know, then, we, then we want to get married. But then where where is all of that now? Five years later. Ten years later. Fifteen years later. We ain't even talking anymore. We just walk by. We leave notes on the, on the counter. Come on, y'all. <laughs> All right, watch this now. Marriage is, is a contented, con, contented, meant, ugh, I'm sorry. Marriage is contented commitment that goes beyond feelings to a devotedness, to a level of friendship that is deep and satisfying. If you don't love your husbands, you need to train yourself to love him. Serve him kindly and graciously day by day, and soon you will make a, such a great investment in him, you will say to yourself, I put too much of myself into this guy to not love him. <laughs> it is a sin to disobey this command. Now, let me, let, me, let me take you back to why this is being said. Among the Bible-believing women of the first century, there was a big challenge in loving their husbands. For various reasons and in various degrees, those women found themselves to be either minimal or no feelings of love for their husband. Believing wives almost always want to obey the Lord, thus they submit and fulfill their responsibilities to their husbands. Watch this. But often only dutifully, and not lovingly. I know I'm, I'm hitting it because we, we in divorce court as Christians. So I, I know I'm, I'm in the spot. It is not just that loving your husband is a virtue. Paul says that not loving him in a way that he can feel is a sin. Because, see, we can, play, we, can, we can play it good, boy. We can play good. We can come in here, and we look good when we, we get in the car together, and when we go home, whew. I was 
talking to somebody on the phone yesterday, and I was talking about going out of town. And I said, you might want to talk to your husband and make sure that that's all right. I need to talk to him. I run this house. So, okay. Okay. Now, when I told her that she should talk to him, I wouldn't say that you asking for permission. I'm saying you should be considerate about whatever could, he may have going on, his thoughts, his feelings towards that. Just approach it in a different way, but you can't just roll like that. And y'all know that's how we roll. Y'all know that's how we roll. That's why we always in for counseling. If we just apply the principles of the scriptures, that would cut down 75% of what goes on in the home. I guarantee you. Try it. Try it. Y'all quiet on me. <laughs> I, I, I told you it was child. See, tight, being a tight as two women, it ain't just older women teaching the younger women. You got to teach them the principles. What's there? Your behavior's got to be right first before you can turn around and teach this. And so Paul, y'all know this, as the family goes, so goes the church. God instituted family. Family's important. A father and a mother is important. When that breaks loose, we can't have healthy churches. We can't have healthy churches. Okay. We almost through, y'all. We almost through. So the next thing, the next discipline, she says, love their children in every way, practical, physical, social, moral, moral, and spiritual. Love has no limits or conditions. Okay, I'm going to try to do this gingerly. <laughs> because sometimes we can love one child more than the other. Because one can be off graduating from college, they got it all going on, you know, they don't have to ask for anything. But one won't get out the house, a lot of stuff going on, debt collectors calling the house, all kind of things happening. And you say, I just wish he would be like them. But let's flip this. We can also love them too much. How, what are you talking about, G? How can you love them too much when your love for them supersedes the love of your husband? What did he say first? Love your husbands. When you put that child in front of everything that you should be doing for that husband, when you put that child in front of everything that they're supposed to be doing for God, I, I know I don't have any children, but one thing I do know from principles of Scripture, basketball, soccer, whatever else happens on Sunday, it's going to take a back seat. When I bring my child to church and I bring them and sit them down to hear what is coming from the Word of God, that's when I'm showing them love. Now, we can go play basketball, football, whatever, after church. But nothing happens during church hour. There's not going to be a time where I say, hey, we're not going to be at church because such and such has a game. I know. I know you're looking at me. You're looking at me. Because I know I'm in your seat. Because I know what the world is pushing to us. There was a time barbershops wasn't even open on Sunday. And I'm not telling you that you can't work on Sunday. I'm not trying to tell you that. But Sunday has been set as the Lord's day. And we need to approach it in a different manner than the way we've been approaching it. Because check it out, fellas. Remember, this text starts off with us, men. We set the tone for this. She doesn't set the tone. She can add something here and add something there. But you are the one that's commanded to set the tone for that home. So if you don't set a tone where we all going to church, guess what happens? Guess what happens? 
And then she starts running the home. That's a whole nother topic for another conference, another time. <laughs> All right. So we have the devotion to the family. Now, this should be her demeanor within the family. Watch this now. Sensible, wisely keeping self-control over your passions and desires. Pure refers to moral purity, especially in the context of sexual purity and marital faithfulness. Workers in the home, applying oneself diligently to the caring for one's household. Now, I'm not sitting here trying to tell you, you can't go out and get a job, ladies. Not what I'm telling you. What he's saying is, your first and primary focus should be on your home and what's going on in your home so the strange woman doesn't appear in your home. Hold me, Holy Ghost. See, when you ain't standing on your post and, and, and doing what you need to be doing, things start to happen. But I just love the way Paul, he doesn't, he, this is how we should conduct ourselves as believers within the church. But Paul's focus is on the family because the family's important. And he does it in order, the men, the women, and now to the younger generation. Because we're supposed to set the example. We've got to get it right. We've got to improve ourselves. So he says, be kind. Good, positive qualities. That should just be a sweet aroma in your home. That, and it's because you set that tone. You set that tone. That's what should be going on. Here's another hard one. Being subjects, sub, being subject to their own husbands. And when I say subject, we do you know that that word that y'all don't like, that submissive. Now watch this. It's not a bad word. It's a very good word. To rank, place under. When I come up under my husband's leadership. Now, fellas, she's not going to get up under your leadership unless you got it right in that first verse. Okay, ladies, if he don't have it right in that first verse, then you have nothing to be subject to. But if he's getting it right, fight the Genesis 3.16. Fight it. Y'all know what it says. If you don't, when we get out of here, go, go, go read it. Fight it. Be subject. Come up underneath. Because guess what? When you come up underneath his authority, he protects you. When you're outside of him, you're not protected anymore. So check this out. If you're up under him and he's up under Christ, we're all protected. For whatever comes at us, we can fight it. But what tends to happen is I'm out. And I'm out. Nobody's protected. And so that's what he, 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 be subject to their own husbands. Listen to this. Maturing women are devoted to their husbands. The best way to show this devotion is by subjecting to your husbands. And to submit to your husband is to put your husband first. This does not say submit if your husband is worthy of submission. It says submit, period. Of course, that, of course, that does not mean you, you can't disagree, but you do it in such a way that you don't rebel against your husband. You can disagree and still submit. You should also be careful in a way you relate to other men than your husband. Women, you should be closer to your husbands than any other man. Your husband should be your best friend. You shouldn't be talking more to other men than you talk to your husband. If, if there's a male and he's your best friend and you have a husband, there's something wrong. There's just something wrong. Something that has gotten off track somewhere. Now, I'm not sitting here trying to tell you you can't have male friends. That's not what I'm saying. 
but he shouldn't be closer to you than your husband. You go out of your way. You know, it's such and such's birthday and I had to make a cake, but when your husband's birthday, cake, uh, birthday come around, what you want to do today? You pick the place. But boy, let so-and-so's birthday come around. Oh, I got to go to the store. I got to make this. I got to make this because I can bring it to work tomorrow. There's something wrong there. It's out of order. It's out of order. I I know, ladies. I know. I'm not. I, I promise you, I'm not trying to condemn you. What I'm trying to tell you is exactly what the text is saying. And as I told you before, it starts with the men. The text starts with the men first. Ephesians 5.22, you know the verse. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Now, everything we just talked about gets summed up in this last part. So that the word of God will not be dishonored. That's it. Everything we just talked about before that, this is the reason. So the word of God won't be dishonored, blaspheme or defame. Don't bring scandal to God's word. And solid word, we know about scandal, don't we? Because when you out there on the streets and we in our little pockets, if we're not living who we profess to be, we get talked about. We bring scandal to God's word. And it it goes deeper than that. Not only do we bring scandal to God's word, but we affect the gospel. We affect the gospel. We affect how we can minister because we dishonor God. We haven't stuck to the principles. We haven't stuck to the disciplines. We aren't reverent in our behavior. We're malice gossips. We're drunk into wine. That's not how God wants his ladies. That's not how God wants his lady. He wants you to be devoted to your family, devoted to your husband, devoted to your children. Conduct yourself in a way that is reverent of him so people know who you belong to. It's not even a question. I hate to use this as an illustration, but it works. One of the things that people really didn't question on on a public level was Miss Houston's relationship with God. But her behavior and conduct might say something different. If this is what the gospel looks like, if this is what the gospel looks like, if this is what a relationship with God looks like, why you doing what I do? You talk the way I talk. Why do I need to be associated with your God? We were out in California the last week, and we were around some of our family members, and I promise you, they looked at us like we were strange because we wasn't talking like them. We wasn't doing the things that they were doing. We went to a funeral. A funeral. You should have heard a conversation at the funeral. Me and Camille were looking at each other. I said, are you hearing what's being said? At a funeral, you can't be what the world wants you to be, ladies. You have to be what God wants you to be so that you don't dishonor God. Okay, ladies, I know I hit you pretty hard. I got something for you. 
Let me sum this up. Listening to wise, godly instructions helps to attract the unsaved to our Lord. Now, I got something I want to read to you. And it's not inspired, okay? But I, I really think it sets the tone for everything we just said. And this is God talking to women, okay? When I created the heavens and the earth, I spoke them into being. When I created man, I formed him and breathed life into his nostrils. But you, woman, I fashioned after I breathed the breath of life into man because your nostrils are too delicate. I allowed a deep sleep to come over him so I could patiently and per perfectly fashion you. Man was put to sleep so that he could not interfere with the creativity. From one bone, I fashioned you. I chose the bone that protects man's life. I chose the rib which protects his heart and lungs and supports him as you are meant to do. Around this one bone, I shaped you. I molded you. I created you perfectly and beautifully. Your characteristics your characteristics are as the rib, strong yet delicate and fragile. You provide protection for, for the most delicate organ in man, his heart. His heart is the center of his being. His lungs hold the breath of life. The rib cage will allow itself to be broken before it will allow damage to the heart. Support man as the rib cage supports the body. You were not taken from his feet to be under him. You were not you were taken from his head. You were not taken from his head to be above him. You were taken from his side to stand beside him and be held close to his side. You are my perfect angel. You are my beautiful little girl. You have grown to be a splendid woman of excellence. And my eyes feel when I see the virtues in your heart. Your eyes don't change them. Your lips, how lovely when they part in prayer. Your nose so perfect in form. Your hands so, so gentle to touch. I've, ca I've caressed your face in your deepest sleep. I've held your heart close to mine. Of all the lives and, and, and breaths, you are the most like me. Adam walked with me in the cool of the day, yet he was lonely. He could not see me or touch me. He could only feel me. So everything I wanted Adam to share and experience with me, I fashioned in you. My holiness, my strength, my purity, my love, my protection and support. You are special because you are an extension of me. Man represents my image, woman my emotions. Together you represent the totality of God. So man treat woman well, Love her, respect her, for she is fragile. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs>